العالمين وصلى الله وسلم وبارك على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وأصحابه ومن تبعهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين وبعد Today Wednesday the 25th of the Hijjah 1434 corresponding to the 30th of October 2013 we commence with the third lesson of the book Essential Lessons for Every Muslim by Sheikh Al-Allama Abdul Aziz Ibn Abdullah Ibn Baz Rahimahullah Ta'ala Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen Wa ashadu an la ilaha illallah wa liyu salihin Wa ashadu anna muhammadan abduhu wa rasooluh Sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in Amma ba'd We are in the third lesson of Ad-Durus Al-Muhimma The important lessons by Al-Allama Abdul Aziz Ibn Abdullah Ibn Baz Rahimahullah Ta'ala and we are still on the first lesson which the Imam Rahimahullah mentioned that everyone, every Muslim should learn Surah Al-Fatiha and then the Surahs from Zalzala until An-Nas. And we've talked about Surah Al-Fatiha and Zalzala and inshallah ta'ala today we are going to continue with a brief explanation of these Surah or these Surahs and their major themes. Now we're on Surah Al-Adiyat. A'udhu Billahi Minash Shaitan Ar-Rajim Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim Wal-Adiyati Dabhan Fal-Muriyati Qadha Fal-Mughirati Subha Fa-Atharna Bihi Naqua Fa-Wasatna Bihi Jam'a Inna Al-Insana Lirabbihi Lakanood Wa-Innahu Ala Thalika Lashaheed Wa-Innahu Lihubb Al-Khayr Lashadeed أفلا يعلم إذا بعثر ما في القبور وحصل ما في الصدور إن ربهم بهم يومئذ لخبير By the racers panting and the producers of sparks when striking and the chargers and the chargers at dawn <clears throat> staring up there by clouds of dust arriving thereby in the center collectively Tayyip, Indeed, stop stop there let's go over these first five ayahs from surah to the idea I mean, these are the surahs that you hear recited many times in the salah all right because these are known as what they call al-qisar al-mufassal I mean, the short surahs that are at the end of the quran or towards the end of the the quran uh, and they're called Mufassal because the ayat are usually short. They're usually short ayat. So they're not like the longer ayat. And we need to understand them because, because for the most part, many of the Muslims, this is the first part of the Quran that they memorize. Most people start from Surah to Nas, okay, and then they memorize Juz Amma and then whatever else is easy for them of the Quran. So you hear this a lot in the Salah. وَالْعَادِيَاتِ ضَبَحَ فَالْمُورِيَاتِ قَدِحَ What is this talking about? And what is Allah Azza wa Jal uh, intending for us to understand from these ayat? وَالْعَادِيَاتِ ضَبَحَ Allah Azza wa Jal here is taking an oath by the horses. And horses with the Arabs were preferred over any other animal when it came to battle. When it came to battle, the horses were what they took because the horses are fast and they're strong and they're obedient. They're obedient to the one that is riding it and caring for it. So he, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says here, وَالْعَادِيَاتِ ضَبَحَا He's talking about the horses that are galloping and they're breathing heavy. Okay? فَالْمُورِيَاتِ قَدَحَا The strikes, يعني, or the sparks that result as as they as they are trotting and they are galloping okay فَالْمُغِيرَاتِ subaha. all right and they are attacking in the morning time what does it say فَالْمُغِيرَاتِ subaha in the فَالْمُغِيرَاتِ subaha in English and the chargers at dawn okay so that is that they are that they are attacking they are going to charge this place huh, in the morning time at dawn and as they are riding and galloping through and they are then the what happens the dust begins to rise 
Okay, so you get this picture, you get this picture of a battle scene. You get this picture of a battle scene with the dust coming up and the horses going forward. Now, a horse, like most other animals, most animals have a type of intuition. They can feel when danger is around. You know that from when, for example, if you just walk out the house, you see a cat, the cat automatically freezes, it looks you up and down, it's trying to assess, is this person going to be a cause of danger or not? So animals, they, they have this type of intuition, they know when there's danger. And these horses, these horses, they know that they are heading towards a dangerous situation. All right? <clears throat> But that doesn't stop them from going straight down the middle. All of them. In the wasat. In the middle. So they go right to the battlefield. Or wherever it is that they are charging and they're attacking and they're putting themselves in harm's way. Alright, so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala here is taking an oath. Now anytime, anytime a person takes an oath, okay, there's the one that is making the oath. There's the thing that they are taking the oath by, and then there's the object of that oath. So for example, someone says, I swear by Allah that tonight I pray Salat al-Maghrib in the Prophet's Masjid. All right? So that person is swearing by whom? By Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. About what? What is the object of them swearing? They want, they want to enforce something. And that is that they pray Maghrib in the Prophet Sallallahu Masjid. So Allah is with here is swearing by these horses. He's swearing by these horses. About what? About what? Read the, the, the sixth ayah. Indeed, six, mankind, seven, six, uh, seven and eight. Indeed, mankind to his Lord is ungrateful. And indeed, so he's he's swearing that mankind is ungrateful and and indeed he is to that a witness. Yani that is mankind witnesses himself. That he is ungrateful. Mm -hmm. And indeed, he is in love of wealth intense. His, his love for wealth is intense. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is swearing about these three things. This is the object of the oath. That man is ungrateful and that he himself is a witness to the fact that he is ungrateful and that what? That his love for wealth is intense. What is the relationship between what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is swearing by and what he's swearing about. I want you to just ask yourself that question right now. Because this is going to come, this is repetitive in the Quran. The next time we're going to cover it, inshallah ta'ala, and this, and this juz is when we get to wal asr. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is swearing by the time in the insana la fi khusr, that mankind is in a state of loss. And so what is the relationship? You always when looking at the Quran, you want to know what is the relationship between these ayat. So what is the relationship between these horses that are going to war, that, are, that have been prepared for war, and the fact that mankind is ungrateful, and mankind witnesses that himself, and that he is in, his love for, for wealth and money is intense. Oh yeah. Here, here, the horse is obedient to his master. Even though he knows that his master is taking him to a situation that is dangerous, he's still loyal and he's obedient because his, his owner, his owner fed him and gave him drink and provided for him a place to shelter him from the sun when it was hot and sheltered him from the cold when it was cold outside and he trained him and he cared for him and, and so as a result of that he has a degree of loyalty to his owner and he's grateful to his owner to the point that even when he knows that he's going into a dangerous situation he goes out of loyalty to his owner as for mankind, look at the relationship between mankind and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Inna al-insana li rabbihi la kanood. Insan 
man, when it comes to his Lord, is kanud. Kanud means not just someone who is ungrateful. Someone who always talks about the hardships that they have or their calamities and they are totally neglectful of the blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and they don't acknowledge the blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The exact opposite the exact opposite of the horse with its owner. You look at mankind with his owner, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, who does a lot more than just provide with food and shelter, but provides mankind with every type of ni'mah that is imaginable. Yani when you look at a horse, did, did man, yani did the horse's owner give him the ability to see? Did he give him the ability to run? Did he? No. None of, all of that is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So even that ownership is not independent of the fact that Allah is the true master and the true owner of that, of that animal. But as for mankind, his owner is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who has given him everything. But yet Allah when commanding mankind to do what? Enter into Islam in totality. Pray, Ya Abdullah. Give zakat. Hmm. Mankind, he acts like the money that he has is from his own hands, like something he did very special that Allah didn't give him the ability to do. So now when it's time to pay zakat, he doesn't want to pay zakat. It's time for salah. I'm busy with something else. Busy with work. Busy with collecting money. Busy watching TV. Busy doing whatever. Busy. Too busy for salat. Hajj, put that off. Maybe after 20 years, 30 years or whatever. So man, and that's the, that's the Muslims. Not to mention those who have not even entered the fold of Islam and look at their lack of gratitude towards the one who created them. So Allah paints this picture for us in the Quran of this dangerous situation and the dust flying and the horses going there because of the loyalty. Does Allah put us in a dangerous situation? Absolutely not. Everything that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has instructed us to do is because it is for our own good. It is for our own good. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala swears by the horses, yani the, the, the characteristics that have already proceeded to remind us of the way that we are supposed to behave with our Lord subhanahu wa ta'ala. Read the last three ayat. Inshallah. But does he but does but does he not know that when the contents of the graves are scattered and that within the breasts is obtained, indeed the Lord with them that day is full, fully acquainted. So here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that even though this is the state of mankind and that they are ungrateful and full of love for their wealth, intense love for their wealth to the point that takes them away from the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah here is reminding mankind that they will be taken out of the graves and that everything that is in their chest Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is fully acquainted with that. Not just that he knows, because there's a difference between al-alim and al-khabir. Alim is the one who knows everything. And al-khabir is the one who is acquainted even with the most precise of affairs. That goes back to the difference between ilm and khibra in the Arabic language. But anyway, the point is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala here is informing mankind that he knows everything about them and he's fully acquainted with everything that is in their chest, in their breast. And so he reminds mankind to fear him, subhanahu wa ta'ala, and not allow that intense love that one has for wealth, forget the duty that they owe to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because even, even mankind's ability to strive for wealth is due to something that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given them in the first place. Allah just gave that person the ability to strive for whatever wealth it is that he's striving for. So don't allow that to make you forget your duty to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and forget the hereafter. And notice that here, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions, he mentions that 
he is the one who is well acquainted with man's actions. Now this surah, surah al-Adiyat, comes after what surah? Huh? Zalzala. Right. In Zalzala, who is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala saying will see, uh, see the actions? Each and every person himself will see his own actions. He will be the one, if, if, if there's any good that he's done, he'll see it. And if there's any evil, even an Adam's weight of evil that he's done, he'll see it. And here, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions that he, he is the one that is well acquainted with the deeds. So everything that you see, Allah is even more acquainted with those deeds. Allah is even more acquainted with those deeds. Likewise, likewise, a person in Surah to zalzala Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is talking about seeing the deeds. So maybe a person begins to think that it is the outer deeds, the apparent deeds that one sees. But here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying that he's even acquainted with what is in the chest. Yani those actions of the heart. And so we see how these two surahs uh, intertwine and complement one another when it comes to these actions and that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is fully aware of man's inner and outer deeds, both that which is apparent and that which is hidden from his deeds. And I forgot to mention that Surah Al-Adiyat is 40 words and 163 letters. It's 40 words and 163 letters without any differing amongst the scholars. So the major theme of Al-Adiyat is the ungrateful nature of man when it comes to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or loyalty to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Yani anyway, these type of meanings. So when you hear adiyat, think about that connection. Think about that connection between those horses and mankind. Now. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Al-Qari'atu mal-Qari'ah Wa ma adraka mal-Qari'ah يوم يكون الناس كالفراش المبثوث وتكون الجبال كالعهن المنفوش فأما من ثقلت موازينه فهو في عيشة راضية وأما من خفت موازينه وأما من خفت موازينه The striking calamity. What is the striking calamity? And what can make you know what is the striking calamity? It is the day when people will be like moths, dispersed. And the mountains will be like wool, left up. Okay. Right. These first five eyes. Surat al qariya 36 words. 152 letters and it is said that it is the 30th surah that was revealed and it was revealed in Mecca it was revealed in Mecca Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says Al-Qari'ah here and it reminds you sort of for those of you who have memorized some of the Quran of surah Al-Haqah Mal-Haqah وما أدراك ما الحاقة القارعة ما القارعة وما أدراك ما القارعة here this is القارعة is one of the names of the day of judgment and the word in Arabic قرعة it means to strike something to hit something severely Yani, they use it for example, just to give you a, a, an example, if a person was sleeping and someone came by, came to his house in the middle of the night and began to bang on the door, that person who was sleeping wakes up and he's startled. Okay, it's not just a normal knock. Knocking on the door is one thing and banging on the door is another thing. And then you look at the time. It's, it's very quiet in general. It's the middle of the night. Nothing's happening. All the stores are closed. Nobody's driving their cars down the street. So it's a very quiet time. And then somebody just comes and bangs on the door. 
they would say qara al bab okay so he banged on the door al qari'ah okay so it is like this striking that happens okay that startles everyone that hears it whatever it is it startles them and if it doesn't if it, if it doesn't startle someone it's not called qara it's not called that so here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions that al qariah now this this type of style in any language but in the arabic language particularly since we're talking about but even in english if someone said the car your question is what about the car somebody just came to you and said the car so your next question is what about the car okay because there's just a subject and there's no predicate there's nothing to tell us about the the car so likewise here in arabic there's just the subject al qariya they translate as what striking calamity they say right so that striking calamity if you will and so it's as if someone said what about it so allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says mal qariya what is this striking calamity and what will cause you to know what it is in other words only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can tell you about what al-qariya is because it's from the affairs of the unseen and all of the affairs of the unseen we only know what we've been informed about it by revelation that is from the Quran or from the Sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Other than that, there's no guesswork. We can't make qiyas or some analogical or analytical dedu uh, analogical deductions by by way of it. No, the only way we know is because Allah subhanahu wa taala has informed us. So He's going to tell us what what al qariya is. Now, automatically, a believer who hears this is in awe because he's scared. Al qariya. Yani it's something that's going to startle mankind. And that's why in the fourth ayah he says what? Read it. It is the day when people will be like moths dispersed. Okay. Yawma yakunu nasu kal farash al On that day, people will be like insects, moths, flying insects. And what do flying insects do when they see light? Huh? They head towards it. Likewise, people are going to actually head towards the fire because they're not going to know. They're not going to know what's actually happening. They, 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 they wake up as if they come up startled. Like what? Like and not like birds. Birds travel in packs, all in the same direction. When you think about moths, and think about think about when there's a campfire, for example. How the insects are? They're flying in all different types of directions. There's, there's chaos. And so Allah Azza wa Jalla is painting this picture for us, giving, showing us how it is going to be on that day. الْجِبَالُ كَالْعِهْنِ uh, الْعِهْنِ is wool, okay? And منفوش means that it's been pulled apart. Because, you know, when wool is to get stuck together, it's not the same as when one pulls it apart now, it becomes very light, okay? And like strands. So, what happens from the zelzala, from, as the result of the earthquake, and from the mountains now striking one another, the mountains themselves become like this, this wool. Not, not these heavy structures that you see right now, but it becomes like unthreaded wool, carded wool. This is how the mountains become. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, this surah is warning us. It is warning us about al-qariya. Yawm al-qiyamah. Types. so what do we do? Who, who is it that is going to be, what is going to happen to those people now that are dispersed? Now, nah, read. That as for one whose scales are heavy with good deeds, he will be in a pleasant life. Ah. So here, these first, this this surah has eleven ayahs. The first five, Allah Subhanahu wa Taala is describing the qiyamah and how it is going to be. And the next two ayahs, he talks about those who have heavy scales. And we know that on Yom Al Qiyamah, there will be real scales with pens. And the deeds will be placed on them. He whose 
deeds, who whose good deeds weigh heavy, for who if he then he will he will be in a delightful existence. He will be in Jannah. He will be in bliss. For he whose scales are heavy. Now, but as for one whose scales are light, his refuge will be an abyss. And what can make you know what that is? It is a fire intensely hot. As for those whose scales are light, their bad deeds outweigh their good deeds. Their good deeds. And subhanAllah, no one is destroyed in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala except for one who has destroyed himself. Because Allah Azza wa Jalla, even for the believers in this life, the deeds are multiplied ten times over, at least. And then on Yawm Al-Qiyamah, Allah Azza wa Jalla multiplies the deeds of His servants as well. As for the bad deeds that a person does, only that deed, no, it's not multiplied. It is not multiplied. It is written as what it is. So if a person's good deeds do not outweigh their bad deeds, then that shows that they are at fault for not doing enough to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So here, here we have these four ayahs that talk about Jahannam. And that the one whose deeds are light, the one whose scales are light, then he will be in a fire of hell wal iyadu billah. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to protect us from that and make us from the people of Jannah. And we should make that dua a lot, often. Asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for Jannah and seeking his refuge from the fire. So here, what we see in this ayah, or what we see in this particular surah, is that again, we have a zalzala, which is talking about Yawm al Qiyamah. And then we have Al Adiyat, which reminds us of the resurrection and that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is fully aware of our deeds and not to be too busy with the dunya. And then we go now to Al Qari'ah which informs us because this hasn't this hasn't proceeded in this in these two sorters that just proceeded from Zalzala wal Adiyat and we come to Al Qari'ah which gives us a description of the Qiyamah and that people will be divided into two categories some of them in Jannah and others in hell waliyadu billah naam bismillahir rahmanir rahim الهاكم التكاثر حتى زرتم المقابر كلا سوف تعلمون ثم كلا سوف تعلمون كلا لو تعلمون علم اليقين لترون الجحيم ثم لترونها عين اليقين ثم لتسألن يومئذ عن النعيم Competition and worldly increase diverts you until you visit the graveyards. No, you are going to know. Then no, you are going to know. No, if you only knew with knowledge of certainty, you will surely see the hellfire. Then you will surely see it with the eye of certainty. Then you will surely be asked that day about pleasure. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in this surah, surah al-Takathur, which is 28 words and 120 letters. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Al-Hakum al-Takathur. The general theme of this surah is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is prohibiting mankind from those things which preoccupy him. Allah is prohibiting man from those things which preoccupy him and make him forget his meeting with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And one of the main things that preoccupies man is his desire to amass things. 
التكاثر التكاثر not just you, you hear this word كثير what does كثير mean does anyone know what كثير means yeah. anybody that's learning here huh a lot okay كثير means a lot التكاثر is تفاعل so it's not just that a person wants a lot but they want to pile it up they want to pile it up and amass it and usually usually it, it implies some type of competition as well some type of competition here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is reminding us not to allow this concept or this issue of takathur to take us away from from our remembering him subhanahu wa ta'ala and most of the time it is the attempt to pile up wealth as the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said law kana libni adam wadiyani min dhahab wa fidda labtagha ilayhi ma akhar if the son of Adam, if man had two valleys filled with gold and silver, what would he want? He'd want a third. And he, subhanallah, you have enough, more than enough, more than you could ever do anything with in your entire lifetime. But what happens? He wants a third. Think about it. Think about what happens when a person actually has money and they have this a love for vehicles, for example, cars. So they get a car. About two weeks later, he gets tired of it. Brand new, luxury vehicle. Two weeks later, he's been there. He's done that, as they say. He has it already. Mm, time for a new one. Other people look at him and say, oh, subhanAllah, look at this car. For him, it's, it's nothing anymore. When it, was, when it wasn't his, it was the greatest thing in the world. He got it? No, it's time to get another one now. And then he gets that one, and he gets a third one, and he's never content. And because he's not content, he's not happy. And that's why the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, That true richness, true wealth, is not having a lot of possessions. But real wealth is being content. That's real wealth. A person can have a lot of possessions. You know people, you know of people who have everything. Everything that they can want. And you know what they do? The next week they commit suicide. Not happy. No one who's happy commits suicide. That doesn't happen. So here, the Prophet ﷺ said, If the, if the son of Adam had a valley full of gold and silver, two valleys full of gold and silver, he'd want a third. There's nothing that is going to fill the inside of that human being except for dirt. See, when he dies, that's when he'll realize. SubhanAllah. Look at the end of this hadith. The Prophet said, and Allah accepts the repentance of the one who repents. Literally, that Allah turns towards the one who turns towards him. For the one who turns to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in acceptance uh, and repentance, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala turns to him in acceptance. Meaning that once you hear this hadith and you realize that about yourself too, make tawbah. Repent to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and he'll accept your repentance. And realize that this dunya is not about that. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said, Man asbaha minkum aminan fi sirbihi mu'afan fi jasidihi indu kuta indu kutu yawmi the Prophet said in this hadith that whoever from amongst you awakens and he is secure. His environment is secure. He feels safe. And he is healthy. And he has provisions for his day. Then it is as if he has the dunya and everything that is in it. Every day that you wake up, if you're secure, you're healthy, you feel. Because if a person dies that day, he had everything that he needed. And everything else is extra. 
Everything else is extra. Now, this does not mean, I don't want anybody to understand from this hadith, it does not mean that the Muslim does not put away things and savings and these type of things. We know that later on, when the Islamic State was established in Medina, and the Prophet وسلم, and the Muslim Ummah had a a Bayt al-Mal, if you will, and a, a treasury that was established. We know that the Prophet وسلم, as it comes to Sahih Muslim, he put away provisions for a year. He put away provisions for a year. So this is not something, there's nothing wrong. And the Prophet وسلم, was Imam al mutawakkilin He was the Imam of all of those who put their trust on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but he still put away provisions. He still put away some savings. So there's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with putting away savings. But here, what the Prophet وسلم, is informing us of is that if a person has these things that he mentioned, he feels safe, he's healthy, and he has his provisions for that, then it's as if he has the whole dunya. What else could he want? What else could he want? Because what happens is al al ha means to, to, to distract you. It distracts you. What distracts you? This takathur. This trying to amass wealth. But not just to amass wealth. Because here, in other, in, 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 in other ayat in the Quran, with takathurum bil amwali wal awlad, for example, as it comes to Surah Al Hadith. Uh, trying to have a lot of children and a lot of wealth. And that this, these things distract you from the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Here Allah Azza wa Jal didn't mention what it is that the person is piling up. He left it unrestricted, just like that. Left it like that. Why? Because it is inclusive of everything that distracts one from the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that a person strives to, to pile up and to gather. Even, even some things that are trivial. You see some people that have stamp collections and it busies them. They want to put them in order. Which one was chronological order? This one is from this country. According to value of the stamp, put it, make sure that it's under the plastic properly, that this one doesn't get bent on the edges. And, and they use their time just collecting. They want to make sure that they have more than the next person who has a stamp collection or baseball cards or whatever it might be that people collect that take them away from the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is trivial. So anything that a person tries to pile on in a mass, and this is considered a takathur. I want to make sure that you have the concept of takathur down. And it also usually, like I said, it involves that concept of competition. This person wants to have more than his neighbor has, more than his cousin has, more than his brother-in-law has, for example. Because he wants his family and his wife uh, to be looked at as being better than her sisters, for example. And so this is a motivating factor and it takes him away from the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and so he uses he uses the na'im because huh? at the end of this surah what does it say? ثُمَّ لَتُسْأَلُنَّ يَوْمَ عَنِ naim. that on that day that day when you meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala you're going to be asked about the na'im the delights that you had, the pleasure the gifts that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given you. Did you use those gifts to remember Allah? Or were those gifts used to take you away from the remembrance of Allah? And even on this particular topic of gifts, a person has to remember that even here, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, ثُمَّ لَتُسْأَلُنَّ يَوْمَ إِذِنْ عَنِ النَّعِيمِ النعيم All of the gifts that He has given you. Tangible and intangible. You are going to be asked about knowledge. Knowledge is a ni'mah from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That knowledge that you have. See, because a lot of times people think na'im, ni'mah. That's uh, 
the blessings that Allah has has given someone in his food and his drink and his house and his dwellings and these type of things his beautiful wife and all of this but it also includes the intent knowledge in and of itself is a name hidayah guidance is a name from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala these things that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has provided you with did you use them to obey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or did you use them in disobedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala understand that concept because because if you think about the hadith that is known as Sayyidul Istighfar Sayyidul Istighfar the hadith that is the master the Prophet وسلم, taught said that this dua is the master of forgiveness whoever makes this dua in the morning and then he dies before the night comes then he will be forgiven of his sins and whoever says this dua in the evening and dies before the morning comes then he will be forgiven of his sins anybody memorize the dua? Allahumma anta rabbi la ilaha ila ant khalaqtani wa ana abduk wa ana ala ahdika wa wa'adika ma istatai this is the part I want, what's coming next? what's the next part of the dua? a'udhu bika min sharri ma sanat what does that mean? I seek refuge in you Oh Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from the evil of what I have done keep going I acknowledge, I acknowledge to you, O oh Allah Azza wa Jal, your favors upon me. I acknowledge your favors upon me. What's next? So you, you see here, a person is confessing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that Allah has given him favors. Uh huh. And I acknowledge to you my sins, my shortcomings. What's the relationship? Pay attention. This is a very subtle point that if you understand this point, you will gain the benefit of this dua. You gain the benefit of this dua. Abu Ulaka bi ni'matika alayya. I confess, I acknowledge to you the favors that you have given me and I acknowledge my sins what's the relationship between the favors and the sins is that you don't disobey Allah except that you have misused one of his favors that he has given you every sin that man commits is a misuse of a ni'mah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala every sayyah Every dhamb, abu ulaka bi dhambi. I acknowledge to you my sins. All of those sins, every sin that a person commits is a because he misused the ni'mah from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Thumma la tusalunna yawma idhin anin na'im. And then you will be asked on that day about the na'im, about all of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's delights and pleasures that He has given you. What does that mean that when you commit a sin, you misuse Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's ni'mah? What does that mean? Anybody willing from amongst you right now? Anybody willing to sell his tongue? Yani somebody comes along and says, listen, I give you a million dollars. Just, I want to take your tongue out your mouth. Give it to me. I need to get, somebody else got theirs chopped over. It. Anybody willing to do that for a million? Hey, we'll do an auction. Two million. Three million. I feel like I'm at the auction, really. Nobody, right? Not even the tongue. Type the eyes, maybe. Subhanallah. Allah Azza wa Jal gave you your tongue for free. Majan, balash. For nothing. He gave you that tongue. Type. Every time you use the tongue, kulli humazatil lumaza. Woe unto those. Every slandering backbiter. Slandering backbiter is done with what? with the tongue so when a person slanders someone and backed by someone it is a misuse of the ni'mah of the tongue that you wouldn't sell for three million and I think if I went even a little higher you probably still wouldn't sell it it's a misuse of a ni'mah every time someone listens to someone else backbiting and doesn't say Akhi, stop stop there or listens to music and doesn't prevent himself 
or listens to anything that's haram or looks at something that is haram. It is a misuse of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's ni'mah. Abu ulaka bi dhambi wa abu ulaka bi ni'matika alayya. You understand the connection? Because every sin that a person does is a misuse. They have misused that ni'mah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So here in this surah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, Alhaakum takathur. That this piling up has diverted you from the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala hatta zurtumul maqabir. And notice here, it says until you visit the graves. It's not talking about visiting the graves. Like you go and say, Assalamu alaikum ahla diyar min al muminina wal muslimin. No. Until you go to the grave. That is until you die. It is at that point when a person will realize that all of this that they've amassed means nothing. It has no value. And it doesn't help them at all. It doesn't help their cause at all when they stand in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But notice here that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not say until you die. But he said until you visit the graves. Notice there's an important point here that we gather from this, from this ayah. Because, because a ziyara to visit is usually for how long? Not long. You go visit somebody an hour, two hours, three hours. If you stay for five hours, it's, it's enough. It's time to go. And that is because the time that a person will remain in the grave is relatively short to that which comes after. Eternity. Either to Jannah, as it comes in Surah Al Qari'ah, or to the fire. Either to Jannah, for who if he till Notice how these surahs all connect. For who if he till then he is in bliss, he is in Jannah. But for the one whose deeds, or for the one whose scale is light, then he will be from the people of the fire. So that time that he spends in the grave is relatively short. It's like he's just visiting. That's just a stopover until e the, the eternal abode, abode of a person. And the Prophet Sallallahu said about this life, Kun fi dunya ka abiru sabil. Be in this life as if you are a stranger or someone that's just going past, going through. Not even a visitor. Not even a visitor. At least when you visit someone, they basically, they know you. Be in the dunya as if you are a stranger, just get through it. Because it's also relatively short. Even shorter than the time period that one spends in the grave. And then they will be resurrected, and that is when the eternal life will begin. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about al yaqeen He talks about the certainty. And there are three levels of certainty that are mentioned in the Quran. There's ilm al yaqeen and there's ayn al yaqeen and there's haqq al yaqeen The first level, that is certainty of knowledge. That second level, seeing it. The certainty that comes as a result of seeing it. And haqq al yaqeen is the certainty that results from experiencing it. So for example, if we were to ask you about the country Brazil, is Brazil a country? You sure? Yaqeen, you have certainty that Brazil is a country? Tight. Have you seen it? You been there? Huh? Oh, you've seen it on videos. So when you see it, huh, when you actually see it, then the certainty actually increases. Okay, so you know that there's a country called Brazil and then you see it. For example, someone shows it to you on a map, you see pictures, and if you actually go there, then that is haqq al yaqeen. So you have ilm al yaqeen, where that's the knowledge of it. Ayn al yaqeen is when you see it, and then haqq al yaqeen, which is one, one actually experiences it. So read the ayat again. <laughs> Competition is 
competition and worldly increase diverts you. Until you visit the graveyards, know you are going to know, then know you are going to know. Know if you only knew with knowledge of certainty, you will surely see the hellfire. Then you will surely see it with the eye of certainty. Then you will surely be asked that day about pleasure. So again, the way that this surah directly relates to Al-Qari'ah is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has informed us in Surah Al-Qari'ah that he whose deeds are light will be from the people of the fire. And what is the main cause of a person's deeds being light, their scales being light? It's because they were busy with takathur, piling up and amassing whatever they could from the wealth of this dunya and its pleasures, and that took them away from the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, so it made their deeds light. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the final ayah that you will be asked about and naeem. Interestingly enough, the Prophet sallallahu went out one night and he saw Abu Bakr and Umar radiallahu ta'ala and Huma. And he said to the two of them, Ma akhrajakuma fi hadi al-sa'ah. What is it that is taking you out of your homes at this hour? And they said, Wallahi ya Rasulullah, we have not left our homes except that we are hungry. SubhanAllah. Sahab of the Prophet alayhi salatu wa salam. So we have not left our homes except that we are hungry. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said that, I have left my home for the same reason that you have left your home. I'm hungry as well. That's why the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa left the house. And so they went to the house of one of the Ansar. And they knocked on his door and they gave the salams and the wife came to the door. And she said that the husband is not there. But she brought them some dates and some water. And different kinds of dates. The dry dates, the rutab, which are the fresh dates. And they began to eat. And then the man of the home came back to the house. And when he saw that it was the Messenger of Allah, subhanahu wa uh, Messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and his two companions, he was so honored that he said, there, is no, there are no guests that one can have better than these guests. And so he went out and he slaughtered one of his sheep. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam told him, don't slaughter the one that, al-halub, yani the one that gives the milk. So he went out and he slaughtered his sheep and he brought it back and the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and Abu Bakr and Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhuma ate their fill. And then the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said to them that you will be asked about this na'im. You will be asked about this na'im, this delight and this pleasure that you have, you'll be asked about it in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And all of us should recognize that every blessing that we have, we are going to be asked about it by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Naam. <clears throat> بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والعصر إن الإنسان لفي خسر إلا الذين آمنوا وعملوا الصالحات وتواصوا بالحق وتواصوا بالصبر by time indeed mankind is in loss except for those who have believed and done righteous deeds and advised each other to truth and advised each other to patience and advised each other to patience after a takathur surat a takathur where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about those things which cause mankind to be diverted from the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and that leads to a person's destruction and puts him in the category of the losers on Yawm Al-Qiyamah because anyone who goes to the fire is a loser on the day of judgment after talking about 
that and what leads to one's destruction Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions this surah surah al-asr to give mankind the ingredients for salvation and if one was to ask you what is the theme what is the theme of surah al-asr then what you should say is the means to salvation how is one saved what does one have to do in order to be saved Allah begins the surah by making an oath about time Al-Asr and some of the scholars of tafsir say that the intention behind this particular oath is the time Al-Asr that is towards the end of the day because it is a very special time like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran حافظوا على الصلوات والصلاة الوسطى protect preserve your salat and especially the salat al-wusta that middle salat which is salat al-asr and other scholars of tafsir say that the intention here is time in general is time in general because what is going to lead to salvation as we will see is performed during the person's life and a person's life is his time and his time is his capital and that is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says Inna insana lafi khusr. that mankind is in a state of loss al khusr okay is the opposite of a rib and notice here, there's a, they, these are like business terms, if you will, but we understand it in this context. A person, when, when they go into business, they start out with what? They start out with capital. With what is known in Arabic as Ras Mal, okay? So they have some capital. And then they invest that money that they have, that capital, into some product or something. And then at the end, they've either profited something or they've what? Or what? They lost. That is khusr. That is khusr. Inna al insana lafi khusr. Okay, insan, without a doubt, indeed, he is in loss. He lost. What is, what is man's capital? What, what is your smile? What is your capital? What is, what is your money that you start? It is your time. It is your time. Wal-asr. That's what you have. You have some time on your hands.
this surah Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala swears by the time that everybody is in a state of loss your time is your capital how do you invest it how do you invest your capital so that you will not be from amongst those who lose when they invest and look at look at this issue of time is critical as al hasan al basri rahimahullah ta'ala say ya ibn adam innama anta ayyam fa idha dhahaba yawmun dhahaba ba'dhuk o oh, son of adam you comprise of nothing but days so every time a day goes by or every day that goes by part of you goes part of you goes you lose part of who you are every time that a day goes by this issue of time is critical in Islam it's critical in Islam we we should not have to look outside of the Muslim ummah to find out the importance of organizing one's time using one's time wisely dividing one's day up this is something that we should have it should be an integral part of the life of every Muslim all of you all of you are in that state of al khusran yani none of you are profiting from your investment of the time except for those who use their time with four things with four things illa alladhina amanu those who have iman and iman has to be based on knowledge one cannot have faith in anything and believe in anything without having proper knowledge of it illa alladhina amanu wa amilu salihat and those who do righteous deeds wa tawasu bil haqq and mutually advise one another with the truth and what is the truth the truth is that iman and righteous actions and so it's not just that you do it but that you advise others with it as well and you call them to that belief that knowledge that you have and the actions the righteous actions and that you are patient in that call because some people may not accept what you're saying and we're going to deal with that in a bit more detail tomorrow inshallah ta'ala because of the importance of this surah that is surah al-asr it is one of the most comprehensive even though it's very it's it's short it is one of the most comprehensive surahs in the Quran and it has a significant importance amongst the muslims and it is read in salah all of the time so inshallah ta'ala tomorrow we'll pick up to deal with those four things in a bit more detail not exhaustive because that's not the intention of these lessons but to give us some of the meanings or clearer meanings of uh, surah al-asr inshallah ta'ala until until surah an-nas wallahu a'lam wa sallallahu wa sallam wa barak ala nabiyyina muhammad as for the questions inshallah ta'ala we'll take them but there was a question yesterday uh, that the brother asked that was not uh, fully answered and so perhaps it may cause some confusion the, the brother yesterday asked the, the last question that was asked was about those people who leave off Salat what was the question uh, yeah yeah nah. uh, for those who for those who leave off Salat for a period of time do they have to make up those Salat do they have to make up the Salat and then he gave the example of someone for example who when they accepted Islam they didn't pray five times a day that was the example and the answer to that question ta'ala, is that for those people who have left off Salat with a valid excuse Islamically there's a legislative excuse for them like a woman who leaves off Salat for a mitzvah or a person who leaves off Salat during a long period uh, when they're in a coma for a long period of time and they don't pray and uh, also a person who accepts Islam and is not aware that it is obligatory to pray five times a day and that's conceivable 
That is, that happens. There are some people that when they accept Islam, they know that Muslims pray. But they don't know the importance of prayer. They may not understand the concept of it being obligatory. Oh, that's just something good to do. And this is, um, unfortunately, some people accept Islam and because of their distance from any Muslim community, this is the concept that they have. For those people, once they find out that Salah five times a day is obligatory, then they have to pray five times a day and they don't have to make up, they don't have to make up the Salah that they missed for the previous three months, six months or however long it took them to become aware of the fact that Salah is obligatory upon them. As for what happens with some of the Muslim youth who at the age of 17 or 18, they leave the house of their parents. When they're with their parents, they pray, at least sometimes. And then they go astray. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to protect us and our children from this. That they go out and perhaps even go to a different country for studying or whatever like that and they leave off the salah in totality. Or a person goes through a period where they don't pray at all for a year, for two years, for three years and many of you may have heard some of the examples of people sending up questions about that. If a person leaves off salah in totality, they cease to be a Muslim. The Prophet said, بَيْنَ الرَّجُلِ وَبَيْنَ الشِّرْكِ وَالْكُفْرِ تَرْقِ الصَّلَاةِ yani A person who leaves off salah has entered into the realm of disbelief and shirk. الْأَحْدُ الَّذِي بَيْنَنَا وَبَيْنَهُمُ الصَّلَاةِ فَمَنْ تَرَكَهَا فَقَدْ كَفَرِ The covenant that is between us and them is the salah. So whoever leaves it off, then he has disbelieved. And the companions of the Messenger وسلم, didn't see any, didn't see leaving off or abandoning any action to be kufr except for salah. And those who left the salah were deemed to be disbelievers. And this is the correct opinion and the opinion amongst the majority of the salaf of this um, ummah is that the one who leaves off salah in totality, then he ceases to be a Muslim. So if Allah Azzawajal blesses that person with hidayah and blesses them to come back to the deen and they begin to pray again, they don't make up those salat that they missed because the time that they were missing the salat at that particular time when they had left salat in totality, they were not a Muslim at that particular time and then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blessed them to come back to the deen. So they don't make up those salat. As for a person, for example, who uh, last week they left off some salat for some reason two three four whatever they have to they must make up those salat that is a duty that they owe to allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alaykum. is it permissible to wear clothing with pictures on them it depends on the type of pictures if there are pictures that are of trees or something that does not have a soul then it is permissible to wear clothes with those type of pictures however the pictures that have clothes uh, that uh, the clothes that have pictures of animals or human beings that have a soul in them then it is not permissible to wear and it's even worse to come to the masjid it's even worse to come to the masjid with those type of clothing. So it is not permissible to wear those type of clothes because the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam mentioned in many authentic hadith the prohibition of making pictures and therefore wearing them is also prohibited. Now, Assalamu Alaikum. Is it obligatory on every Muslim to call the non-Muslims to Islam? For the, for the Muslims who are living amongst the non-Muslims, for the Muslims who are living amongst the non-Muslims, then they have a duty to call the non-Muslim to Islam if they have the knowledge to do so, if they have the ability to do so. And that is the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam when he sent Mu'adh ibn Jabal radiallahu ta'ala anhu to Al-Yemen he sent him and he told him in the Katati, Qawman Ahl Kitab. He told him, You are going to a people from the people of the book. So he is telling him, Listen, these are not people who are ignorant. There are people who have scripture. They were given a previous scripture. They have some knowledge. They have some knowledge about Sharia in general. They have some knowledge about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Their knowledge is corrupt or it has been 
Their books have been corrupted, but they still have some knowledge. Wallahu a'lam wa sallallahu alayhi wa sallam wa barakatuh. Ameen. Muhammad. Subhanakallahu wa bihamdika.